fresh meat. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was a formless void. And darkness covered the face of the deep. But the darkness wasn't empty. It was full of creatures. Full of demons. This cowboy shit! Sometimes you get those one-off movie ideas that just work. The film runs a crisp 92 minutes, but between the opening and ending Crypt Keeper segments, it's much closer to 80. What it packs into those 80 minutes are a kickin' soundtrack, fun characters with great performances, and special effects that give us mutants what we want. Blood, breasts, and beasts. Cut, 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 cut! What the hell are you doing? You call that acting? Tales from the Crypt was a wildly popular HBO series that took everything that made the Amicus anthology films of the 60s and 70s and dialed them way up to 11, just as William Gaines intended them to be when they were getting banned outright. The show lasted seven seasons between 1989 and 1996 and had everything you could want with gore, language, nudity, and tons of people getting their comeuppance by the end of a 30 minute or hour long episode. It also had stars both in front and behind the camera. For a little horror TV show that could, you had some of the era's biggest stars writing, directing, and acting. I'm talking Arnold Schwarzenegger level stars. He appeared in and directed an episode. But just look at the IMDb for the series. It's staggering. I could personally go on forever on this show. It's one of my all-time favorites, but Simone already did that for us last year. Go check out the episode for a blast from the past and a great time. No, today's about the movie the series got. No, the theatrical one. No, the good theatrical one. Okay, I kid. Ardello of Blood is flawed, but actually a good time, and Ritual is... a movie. But today, we're here to properly discuss Tales from the Crypt of Demon Knight. Hearing from you, Carlos. I want to thank you guys for watching Revisited and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click the bell so you can get notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. The movie was released on January 13th, 1995, on a modest budget of $12 million. While January is one of those months horror movies go to die, Demon Knight ended up pulling in over $21 million. While that might not sound like a lot, it was a lot more successful on a smaller budget than many early in the year horror movies are. The script passed through quite a few places on its way to eventual director Ernest Dickerson. Dickerson, mainly a TV director on shows ranging from The Walking Dead to The Wire, also has the Snoop Dogg horror movie Bones on his resume, along with 90s cult classics Bulletproof, Juice, and Surviving the Game. While he is certainly a very well-respected director, Dickerson is probably more revered for his cinematography, particularly on the seven films he did with Spike Lee. The script would start out as a project for Friday Night director Tom Holland, but would pass from him to Pet Cemetery 2 director Mary Lambert. And after that bombed, sorry Lance, it would even be considered by Charles Band and Full Moon. Finally, it landed on the desk of Joel Silver, who was a producer on the Tales from the Crypt TV show. He'd get Universal behind it and even plan it as part of a trilogy. Demon Knight was supposed to be the middle of the three, but ended up going first as the producers thought it would have the best chance to start the trilogy off right. The films would have nothing to do with each other except have the demon key in them, and although the other two planned films would not happen as originally thought, the key would end up in the actual follow-up film Bardello of Blood. Demon Knight has a lot going for it. It's a very succinct story that has macro consequences in a micro setting. The film has a siege feel to it with our cast of characters stuck in a hotel that used to be a church, with their real estate slowly shrinking as the demons begin encroaching on them with head demon Billy Zane leading the charge. This is as good a time as any to just throw it out there that this is Billy Zane's movie. Character actor and Frank Darabont regular William Sadler does a great job as the lead with some great dialogue and delivery, and Jada Pinkett Smith is a final girl turned, well, demon knight. But the movie isn't half as good with anyone else in Zane's role. I notice you're not saying anything. Hmm? Is that because you're thinking of something to say? Well, what the hell is there to think about? Back to the Future 2, Twin Peaks, Tombstone, Posse, The Phantom, and of course Titanic would all give him various roles to play, but it's this movie that is forever what I will think of when someone says his name. He plays the character like a cross between Bugs Bunny, Ernest, and Freddy Krueger. He can be suave and charismatic, or he can be a complete psychopath. He plays his character very restrained until the police figure out that he may not be exactly who he says, and then completely lets loose to the joy of audiences everywhere. The movie also does a great job of not over-explaining everything. It starts out with a car chase of Zane chasing Sadler, culminating in them crashing and Sadler wandering around looking for shelter. 
Several star symbols on his hand begin to move as he gets closer to his destination, and each character is introduced with tropes but not a heavy-handed backstory. Hey, maybe I should give him a freebie. Hmm, just what he needs. Someone else screwing him. You have the angry prison release worker, a gossipy but hard-nosed hotel manager, a prostitute, a disgruntled former mailman, and a drunk. We get their names, but none of them have any backstory to speak of. They all play their part and do exactly what is needed of them. Plus, when you have Dick Miller, Lowell from Wings, and the voice of Roger Rabbit in your cast, you just know it's going to be a good time. God damn it, Dutch! What other errands do you have us running for the DA? CCH Pounder, Gary Farmer, and Brenda Baki round out the supporting cast, while legendary John Kassir is here as his iconic Crypt Keeper. The characters aren't your generic dumb bodies just waiting to be slaughtered, either. Once they learn the rules of how to deal with the demons, nearly everyone gets in on the demon killing action, including the kid of the group, who is typically reserved for the annoying also ran character. He gets the joy of destroying Demon Dick Miller's severed head. The key that I mentioned that was supposed to be the link between the movies and the item that the collector is after is a really cool idea and is explained by Sadler's breaker in an organic way while he's trapped with the other humans. There's a bright, almost glowing liquid inside that creates a barrier to the demons that even the head one can't cross. We later find out that it started with the blood of Jesus Christ that was later mixed with the blood of the man who gave it to Breaker and will later be filled and mixed with Breaker's own blood. It's the last key the demons need to reclaim the darkness for themselves. To achieve this, the Collector uses his powers to offer whatever the hotel inhabitants want. For Jada Pinkett Smith's Geraldine, it's complete freedom in trying to sway her into believing that Breaker will ultimately fail. For Uncle Willie, it's as simple as a room full of half-naked women and endless alcohol. And for the prostitute Cordelia, it's just the chance to be really loved. Some of them it works perfectly on, like Uncle Willie and Cordelia, while Geraldine and Pounder's Irene are able to tell him no, with Irene giving him a particularly hilarious and definitive response after the loss of one of her arms. Is that a yes? No. That's me giving you the finger, asshole. Each of the scenes gives Zane's collector a new side to play, with him being silly but sinister, sincere and loving, or honest and threatening. Others try to give him what he wants, like Thomas Hayden Church's Roach character, that's his name and how he acts, stealing the key and giving it to the demons before being betrayed in a move that everyone saw coming except for Roach. Danny stays far enough away, but as a child he's easier to influence, and the collector merely influences him through his own comic book. The effects must be talked about, with everything to the bookend Crypt Keeper sections featuring a blink and you'll miss it John Larroquette as some sort of muck zombie, to the death and possession scenes. Billy Zane punching a hole through the sheriff's head, Demon Cordelia and Demon Danny taking chunks out of Wally and Breaker respectively, and Irene losing an arm while Demon Willie loses his head are all spectacular. The demon transformations range from giving Dick Miller great looking green eyes, long nails, and a skin condition, to Danny and Cordelia looking like a mixture of a deadite from the Evil Dead series and a mid-transformation organism from the thing. This tracks completely as the effects from the show were just as brutal and bloody on a far smaller budget. Even the little things like the demon's glowing green eyes and blood to the bright red liquid in the cross add to the great look and feel of the movie. These effects easily count as a character in their own right. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the soundtrack. There was just something amazing that could happen on a 90s movie soundtrack. They were just built different. While this one doesn't necessarily measure up to, say, uh, Judgment Night, which is an absolute Hall of Famer of a disc, it's no slouch either. Pantera, Megadeth, Machine Head, and Gravediggers all lend songs, while Filter's Hey Man Nice Shot, a song that lives permanently in my Spotify playlist due to this movie, accompanies the opening car chase between good and evil. This was peak 1995, and the soundtrack would even get up to 157 on the Billboard Top 200. This movie will make you want to listen to the soundtrack, and listening to the soundtrack will make you want to watch the movie again. While I'm sad we didn't get the other two movies in the planned trilogy, and the show the movie was tied to would end just a year after the release of the film, I'm so thankful we got this gem unleashed upon us. God damn it! Get that pussy off the table! I meant the cat. It's one of those movies that I will always recommend to someone who is looking for something a little off the beaten path and is in my personal top 10 90s horror films. For the longest time, it was really only available on Laserdisc, VHS, and a bare bones DVD until our friends at Scream Factory gave us a special edition packed with lots of fun interviews and behind the scene features. It's still readily available and not terribly expensive, at least for now, but we all know what happens when cult classics go out of print. The other two films would follow the laws of diminishing returns, but Demon Knight stands alone. You fucking hold dunk, hold dunk, well then there, motherfuckers! All you have to do is give me the goddamn key! 